Welcome to another episode of On La Nose. Did you know that you're probably pooping wrong? Yeah, this is a topic I'm probably going to come back to because it's important. There's a lot of information that people don't get until it's too late. Uh, one of them would be eating enough fiber. You know, they tell us to eat a balanced diet, but they don't talk about the fact that we need a fuck ton of fiber and a balanced diet, according to the food pyramid, just doesn't cut it. And because we're not getting enough fiber, when we go to the bathroom, that stuff isn't quite working right either. And so like the average person, uh, instead of relaxing and kind of, you would kind of push your belly out and then that relaxes the bowel area and then stuff comes out. Instead, they actually strain, so push down with the muscles like in the ass, basically. Um, and you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to strain. It's really bad. It's bad for everything. It makes stuff fall out of your body over time. Um, it causes hemorrhoids and, and muscle tension issues, which women are really prone to having already because we, we police our bodies. Like women hold their stomachs in and stuff, which causes urinary retention and um, vaginal tightness that's painful. If you're a guy and you heard vaginal tightness and you're like, but that's good. No, bitch, it's not. You can't fucking tell the difference between a healthily relaxed vagina and one that has too much tension. Do some reading. So like eating enough fiber, and it's not just fiber. There's different types of fiber. And you want like a mix of those different types of fiber. Um, but eating enough fiber is kind of like going to the gym, but for your, your bowels, uh, your intestines. And it has so many positive effects. It, it feeds good bacteria, um, of which people, especially on a Western diet, are lacking. Um, it lowers the instances of all kinds of diseases that we're still learning about. Because if you look at indigenous populations where they get plenty of fiber and don't get like the, the mass-produced foods, um, they don't get those health issues. Uh, and it's believed to help lower inflammation, stuff like that. Um, but it also keeps the muscles and the nerves in the bowel and the colon area healthy. And so you're more likely to have like successful, complete passing if you're working that area. Walking is also very important for this. Like of all the exercises, walking is like kind of the best one for keeping the bowels happy. The average American is said to get 10 grams of fiber a day. I feel like that's on the high side because if you look at like labels and stuff, even like oatmeal, like if you get Quaker's oatmeal, you get like two grams of fiber. That's it, right? If you buy like steel cut oats from like a lesser known brand, you usually get like four grams. And the, the oatmeals, not so much the Quaker stuff, but the other types of oatmeals that are a little bit less pr um, processed, uh, you actually get a mix of the fiber, which is good. Um, the Quaker brand, you mainly just get soluble fiber. And soluble fiber is important because they believe that it helps um, release cholesterol as you're digesting it. It sort of creates this like goopy stuff. Um, it can also be helpful if you're prone to diarrhea or whatever because uh, it helps slow the gut down. Um, so it can like help solidify things a little bit. But if you're prone to constipation, then it's not helpful. Insoluble fiber is the one that helps sort of off balance that or off, off balance, balance, whatever. So insoluble kind of irritates the gut and gets it moving. You don't want like all of either, really. You just, you want to mix. And depending on which part of the world you're in, there are actually other types of fiber like resistant starch. There's like prebiotic fibers. There's a whole bunch. But in the U.S., predominantly when people talk about fiber, they're talking about soluble and insoluble fibers. So Americans on average get 10 grams of fiber. Let's just say that that's accurate. The recommended amount of fiber, depending on your age and your sex, is 25 to 35 grams of fiber. Now, if you hear this and you're thinking, man, I should add more fiber to my diet, don't aim high to start with. Start small, baby steps, because um, 
Yeah. <laughs> it's not fun. And could actually be a deterrent if you have enough GI upset from adding that much fiber in. But, you know, like some people, when they have a burrito and they haven't had anything like that in a while, and then they're very like gassy and they have like a lot of bowel movement, stuff like that. That's because burritos have tend to have a lot of fiber. They have beans and avocado and stuff like that. So on average, I get between 20 and 30 grams of fiber a day. I do that through um, planning my meals uh, accordingly. I guess that's obvious. Obviously. Uh, but I eat a lot a, of raw, like real stuff, you know. So when I have like, I'll have a shit ton of asparagus and you'd be thinking like you're going to have like five stocks. Now I have like 15. And the way that my plate looks um, is it's like two thirds the green and then protein and a little bit of something else. And for me, like, I usually don't eat like rice because it's like empty calories. I go for something like quinoa. Sometimes I'll do a brown rice quinoa mix. And um, that would be like my dinner. But I just, I, I try to make sure that my meals are are all shaped to support like a specific dietary goal. So even if I get like snacky stuff, I will choose snacky stuff that's say like chickpea based or um, I found a granola that doesn't have nuts in it because I, I don't digest nuts for whatever reason. So that's, they're really painful to eat. Um, you know, I don't eat a lot of oats because I, I do feel like they're kind of empty, empty carbs next to, you know, other things. But you can also, if you really like rice, one of the things you can do is cook rice, leave it overnight and eat it the next day. And it creates this uh, this resistant starch that can be really great for the gut as well. And just making that dietary change can be like amazing for your health in the long run because of the bacteria in the gut and getting things moving regularly. A lot of people are constipated and they don't even know that they're constipated because they poop regularly. So they think that they're fine, but they're not actually pooping enough. Um, another thing that can be done is using a squatty potty or some tool like that, that that helps you get into more of a squatting position and it helps sort of straighten out the, the colon so there's not a kink, so you can uh, pass things more easily and in a more relaxed state. I freaking love that when you go to Stanford, if you're in the GI department, they have squatty potties. So I mentioned earlier, you're not supposed to strain. And um, a lot of people, they just don't remember how to do it the way that we did it naturally when we were little. Um, but like one of the things that you're supposed to be doing versus straining or bearing down with your pelvic floor is if you take a really deep breath, and this is something a lot of people also have a hard time with, um, instead of breathing through your chest, you want to breathe through your belly. That's actually like correct. And as we get older, we get stressed and we start keeping our tension up in our chest. And that can actually like cause all kinds of like physical symptoms like anxiety and stuff that if you just start breathing through your belly, boom, so much better. Um, so if you were to breathe through your belly and, and just relax your belly into that breath and sort of push your belly out. So you're trying to make yourself look basically pregnant, right? Um, and when you do that, like if you were doing that while you're in the middle of a, a bowel movement, um, it would, your, your rectum, your rectum, pelvic floor would be relaxed, but you would still be pushing on the on the the stuff right so it would help the bowels move stuff through and um unless you're like me you have a helper muscle that helps move that stuff through i don't know what that's technically called i just call it the helper muscle mine doesn't work it's defective which is why i know so much about pooping um and this stuff is very important and the earlier you pick up on better habits the better it is in the long run because there's like all these health issues that are just seen as like old people things that are literally the result of a lifetime of bad habits. For example, GERD. Did you know that GERD isn't just 
making too much stomach acid. GERD can be caused by the sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus between the stomach and the esophagus uh, becoming defective. And the things that cause that to become defective are excessive strain. And the things that cause excessive strain is eating food with carbonated beverages, the upsuppression of stomach way, way more. Um, laying down while and or after eating, you should wait a minimum of two hours, better to wait three to four hours before laying down or reclining. Overeating, excessive eating, excessive drinking, stuff like all of these things, they put wear and tear on a valve that did not evolve for overeating in the way that we do it or carbonation or whatever, right? Like it, that's, we're putting like unnecessary wear and tear on it. It's like taking a regular streetcar and then taking it to the track and then expecting the tires and the suspension and the windows to, to all hold up to, to the, the, gosh, words. I'm going to try that again. It's like taking a streetcar to the track and expecting it not to wear out faster, you know, like the suspension, the tires, windows will break, uh, stuff like that. Like you, you know, track cars have, are designed to handle that. We are not, we do not have a way to make ourselves handle the wear and tear of the abuse we put our bodies through because of modern diets and habits and schedules. And the thing is like GERD, acid reflux, fucking sucks like it it's why like older people are stereotypically more likely to eat um really bland foods is because of that because like spicy foods and tomatoes and grease and this and that like all these things can cause uh reflux or cause higher acid levels and the higher acid levels would normally not be a problem unless your valve isn't working. And if your valve isn't working, then it all goes up into your esophagus and stuff. And, and here's, here's the, the thing about that. That can cause cancer. It can cause you to lose your voice. It causes tremendous pain. It can cause swallowing issues where you start getting food stuck in your esophagus. And once the wear and tear is there, it doesn't get better. You spend the rest of your life managing it. And for a lot of people, it's preventable. But nobody tells you the things to do to prevent it until it's too late. So when I first started having issues and I wasn't able to eat, one of the symptoms that I had sounded a lot like GERD. And they were like, no, you have acid reflux, take these medications. And the medications made me worse. Like taking Prilosec literally made me foam at the mouth. <laughs> it was awful. And it ended up, it took a couple of years to figure this out, but it ended up that what I was actually having was not acid reflux. Uh, they did the manometry test, which is where they put these this tube down into your stomach and it, it uh, measures uh, your reflux over 24 hours. And I had less than normal. Um, and I kept being like, it's not reflux. The meds aren't helping. It's not reflux. It's something else. And when I finally got into Stanford, I was like, can we please test me for reflux? But can we also do the test for um, esophagus stuff and see if my esophagus is working correctly? And it ends up that that's what it was. My esophagus spasms near the bottom and food gets stuck and it causes pain. It sounds a lot like reflux. And sometimes the food would even come back up um, when I was laying down and like burn my inside. I went to the ER for the pain one time because it was, oh my goodness. Um, and once I had that diagnosis, I, they went in, they stretched it for me. And then I've learned how to manage it. Like when it, cause it's, it happens sometimes a lot and then sometimes it's better. So it's kind of almost, I think like neur neurological, I, I don't know. I kind of have this theory. It's related to my mast cell stuff, um, like a bunch of other things, but I don't know for sure. And there's no way to, no way to really test it. Um, but yeah, so I learned that drink, like sipping warm, warm tea helps the esophagus relax and that helps get the food down, stuff like that. So if I'm having like a really hard time with it, I can do that. And then I have a chewable antacid that I get from the UK 
that creates a barrier on the inside of the esophagus. Um, and that can also help as well. But thankfully, that hasn't been too much of an issue the last couple of years. As my mast cell stuff has gotten better, a lot of my other weird ass symptoms have also gotten better. But all of that is why I learned so much about um, acid reflux and how it's preventable and stuff. And I learned about fiber in part because I had malnutrition and so I just started learning more about food. But also um, when I was not able to eat solid foods, I had to learn how to feed myself um, and get the nutrition I need and get fiber because I couldn't go to the bathroom because I didn't have anything substantial passing through. Um, and I didn't know that I wasn't going to the bathroom correctly. And so I ended up locked in this issue with spasms where I had tremendous amounts of pain. And it took me about two years of working with a pelvic floor physical therapist to unravel this issue. Um, and I have much better habits now and stuff. But yeah, so like I ended up learning a lot just trying to figure out how to manage what was happening in my own body. Um, and before I got sick, I ate pretty well. I had no awareness of how much fiber I should be eating, but I was eating plenty of fiber just because my preferred diet is, uh, you know, I love eating beans and avocado and vegetables, uh, just not big on carbs. Like if we did spaghetti, we did spaghetti squash. Um, nowadays, I don't digest the spaghetti squash that well, so I do chickpea-based pasta instead of wheat-based. There was this company called Ubiome, or Ubiome. I'm not sure how you say it. I know how you spell it. Uh, it no longer exists. They were not billing correctly, and they got in trouble, and the company was dismantled. But they provided a service where you could send in... Um, your flora and they would look at your bacteria and kind of give you like data, kind of like 23andMe, but for your poop. And um, so I did that while I was on the liquid diet and then did it a couple more times um, as I started to be able to eat more solid foods and I could see like the change in my bacteria. Like I had a lot of like this one bacteria um, because I didn't have enough fiber in my diet. And then um, I also had like really high cholesterol, but it was like good cholesterol. Um, and it's because I wasn't able to counterbalance it with some of the things that I should have been eating. And then as I started to be able to eat solid foods and like I was having a lot of like salads and beans and stuff like that, um, the bacteria changed and I started having more and more of like the good stuff and my cholesterol, like it took, my cholesterol took about a year and a half, but it like totally like normalized and is like super good now. And it was like so fascinating doing the tests and being able to see, you know, like what what was going on and then actually see real changes because of what I was eating. You know, that was for me, like when I started being able to eat solids again, that was so exciting. It was also really scary because I was really afraid it was going to get taken away from me again because it was really hard to adapt to a liquid diet, but the symptoms that I had when I ate stuff was so unpleasant that you couldn't make me eat. I, like, I would not eat stuff that I shouldn't be eating. I just, it was not worth it to me. Um, the interesting thing, and this is one of the things that pointed towards the mast cell stuff early on, was I could eat something like McDonald's and I was fine, but I couldn't have a salad. So basically that roughage, the, the high residue foods were all causing issues for me. And apparently that's really common with people that have the mast cell stuff is that they um, can eat like the shittiest of shitty foods, but they can't eat like the good stuff. So as my, as my system started to settle down and I started having less of these other symptoms, like I had uh, really low blood pressure for years, like, like 90 over 60, uh, 90 over 55. And that was like 
my doctors were like, oh, your blood pressure's fine. I'm like, no, it's not. It's super low. And the nurses would be like, is it always this slow? And I'm like, well, the doctors say it's fine. It's, it's like they didn't want to deal with it because like I already had so many other issues. But um, now that I am not having so many symptoms and I'm able to eat more normally, um, and it took about three years of eating normally and my symptoms getting better. Like the last... I don't know, like, I'm going to say the last few months have been the best since I got sick. Um, I got these really fancy air filters, and I think they're they're helping a lot because the house I'm in has issues, as I mentioned. Um, and I just have a little more reserve. And, I, and part of that, I think, is because my blood pressure is doing better. And one of the symptoms of mast cell is basically being in an anaphylactic state all the time. And we think of anaphylaxis as your throat closing up, but there are actually other symptoms that you can have besides that or along with that, including a really low blood pressure. And really low blood pressure is seen commonly in mast cell stuff. Um, some people that have the mast cell issues they do get anaphylaxis where they they will swell up, like their throat will swell up and stuff. And that's pretty scary. And I've only had that like twice. Um, and it was mild, not super bad. Um, but yeah, like, it's just been fascinating, you know, ignoring all the hardship that comes with what I've been through, just fascinating to watch things change because of what I'm putting into my body. And it's made me very, like, I take it very seriously. Like, I don't eat bad that much. Every now and again, I will splurge. But even when I splurge, it tends to be good quality ingredients. And I have to be mindful of, like you know, not having like high histamine foods and stuff like that because I always feel worse. I get like really bad bloating. Like sometimes in the evening, I just look like I'm pregnant and I get that even when I'm eating well. But if I eat something that was like higher histamine, I will like, it'll be really painfully like hard, like rigid stomach kind of thing. I think it's really easy to take for granted your health. You know, like I, I took my health pretty seriously. I have PCOS. And so I was never able to eat what I wanted. I used to keep a spreadsheet of my food before there were like smartphones with apps and stuff um, because I was terrified of side effects. I was afraid of having diabetes and, and all these things that are, are um, comorbidities or your higher percentage chance of getting if you have PCOS. I just, just terrified. So I was always pretty mindful anyways. But um, after I lost so much health, I just just really, it's just really important to me in a way that I think it's always going to be important to me. And it's always going to be important to me that the people that are in my life directly are also taking care of themselves. You know, like everybody else can do whatever, whatever they want. You know, if I judge them, I'll keep it to myself, you know, because like, I don't, I don't live their life. So I don't know. But, um, people that are directly in my life. It's important that they take care of themselves because I have to witness that, you know, and their good behavior is inspirational for my good behavior and and vice versa. But also like, it's really hard to be around people who don't take care of themselves and then they complain about the issues that they have caused with their decisions. I'm not a fan of that. I don't feel like it's my responsibility to be compassionate when someone did it to themselves. Um, it's just, just no, you know, there are, there are a lot of scenarios that a person can end up with something like diabetes and it's outside of their control. Genetics, environment, money, like, you know, and that's, that's different. But a person with, within that can still fight it. You know, like I was poor for a long time. I'm still technically poor and I still fought it. I still made healthy decisions within that. It just, it required planning ahead. It required buying in bulk, which was more money up front, but less money over time once you start doing it. You know, it required um, sacrifices and, you know, I managed it, but I also had to do my homework and that's 
that's part of the issue as well. Is like people are not well educated about food. They're not well educated about diet or or the fact that things in their body are going to wear out that they never thought about wearing out, such as the sphincter in their esophagus. <laughs> like you know, um, I think technically it's at the bottom of the esophagus, not actually in the esophagus, but yeah, you get the idea. So yeah, so that's I can be difficult. I can be difficult to be friends with because I'll be like, let's go for a walk. Let's eat this. You should eat that. Like, you know, like, and my friends call me the fiber fairy, which you probably now understand why. <laughs> Cause, uh, you know, if someone's like, oh, I'm so constipated or, oh, I have diarrhea. I'm like, you need more fiber. Da -da. Yeah. My perspective on things in general is that everything we do matters, everything, you know, and we basically all have a lot of power to impact ourselves and to impact others for good. Um, I think sometimes we actually have more control, control over how we impact others than we do on how we are impacted. Um, but I just, I just think it matters. I think being mindful and present in the moment, you know, that matters and that we should be present and mindful about the things happening around us, including when people put time into us. Like, you know, you're going to put time into listening to this. That's fucking amazing. You're never going to get that time back. That, that you just spent part of your life with me. And that's amazing. And I appreciate that. And, and I think that like, it's important. It's important to remember that when people decide to put time into us, that that's what they're doing. They're spending a portion of their life with us that they don't ever get back. And it's precious and meaningful. And yeah, and not to be cheesy, but fuck yeah, man. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It just, I think about these things. And I feel these things. I feel them all the time. I don't always express them well, but I feel them all the time. Like I feel this vividness in like every moment, especially when I'm spending it with other people, that these moments matter because our life is precious. It is the only life that we have, you know, unless you unless you subscribe to different ways of thinking. But, you know, science doesn't really support that. So you know, and, and, and technically let's say, let's say we, let's say our energy gets reused, right? Like and we don't remember. So we're still going to miss out on experiencing things in this body, in this life. We might get to experience it again in another machine, but it's not going to be the same. So it's still just as precious. Um, yeah. So my, my point stands no matter what you believe, because even if you go to like a special place, a special fuzzy, warm, happy place after, it's still not the same as this, you know? It's it's just is. This is what it is, and everything else is whatever. I don't believe in anything else, but I I I respect I respect that other beliefs give people comfort. And I don't have a problem with them as long as they don't try to control what I think or do. That's the only time I have an issue with it. But otherwise, like, you can you can think anything, you know. I just think that we're just an amazingly random collection of molecules. And when we die, we go back into the universe and get recycled in some other way that's very different and you know like I think that's pretty awesome that's enough for me I don't know you know not to get all you know like heavy and and whatever just a, just at the like the tail end of this but <laughs> like like I could stop myself well and it's just about 30 minutes so I want to thank you for listening and give mad props to my I don't, I'm not saying that. Hold on. Let me, let me redo that. I would like to give thanks and appreciation to my patrons as always, because you're awesome. 
And to anybody that listens to this and is supporting my stuff, you're also awesome. There is literally no way to succeed in an online environment without the support of other people. So like, you matter, okay? You matter, you matter a lot. And I think next time I'm going to talk about art, my art, because I don't really know anything about art, so I can only talk about my art and my experience with it. And it's been crazy, okay? It's been crazy. But anyway, thanks again. Bye-bye.